Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another screencast by your earth science teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look at stream discharge, continuing on with our hydrology talks and screencasts. Stream discharge is basically the amount of water that's going to pass through a given point in a period of time. So there are a number of things that can increase stream discharge, like we see here. If we increase precipitation, we have more water, so that increases the volume. We increase the volume, it increases our discharge. Lower infiltration will also increase volume. Season, like we see in spring or melting of snow, those all increase volume. And there's some other things too that can increase stream discharge. If we increase the velocity of the stream, that'll also increase your stream discharge. So there's just a number of things basically looking at how that water is flowing and moving. So one would expect that in the spring, we would see more meltwater. So water coming down from mountaintops, collecting into our streams. We would also see some more, maybe possible seasonal rains at that time. So that would increase our stream discharge. Occasionally though, what we may see is that lakes and streams do dry up or their discharge drop down. A couple of scenarios are gonna cause this. If we extract too much groundwater, like in this diagram here, so we have this nice pump, huge cone of depression. So there's lots of pumping going on. What this will do is it'll cause our groundwater to flow into this well area, causing our stream to basically feed the groundwater flow and feed our well. This will decrease the discharge or the volume and that stream will dry up. So as with the causing discharge to decrease, we can also see during the summertime when that water table falls, if we decrease the water table, that'll decrease stream size because now there's less groundwater flow feeding the stream. So, so we can see this maybe in summertime or when we have increased rates of evaporation. Next, we're gonna look at basically trees themselves. Remember, water can enter the atmosphere through vegetation, through trees. So water will actually leave the trees through their, mostly through their leaves, some occasionally through their stems, depending on the type of plant, through very small openings. but the leaves are usually at the top of the tree. So how does all that water get to the top of the tree? We look at these California redwoods, massive trees, extremely tall trees. Water manages to make its way to the top. So how does it do that? Water moves upwards against gravity due to capillary action. And this is what's able to get water to the tops of the trees and to the leaves so that the tree can actually, or the plant can live. There are very, very small pores or very small tubes that run the length of trees and a lot of plants. Because they're extremely small, the water is actually going to move upward. This happens because water is sticky. It's got a positive side and it's got a negative side. Like we can see here, here's the H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. So we have a, the electrons spend more time around our negative side of the oxygen, making this a slightly polar or positive size here. Because of this, water sticks to the sides or to the sides of the capillaries or those small tubes, but also sticks to itself, it's known as cohesion and adhesion. And what we see is smaller the pores, the higher the water rises or an increase in capillarity, just like we have with this diagram. So here, small pores, small tube or pores, you increase capillarity. So if we do size, capillarity, increase the size, we decrease capillarity. There is an indirect relationship between capillarity and pore size. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We'll end our screencast here for today uh, before we go on to Long Island's groundwater. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care.